what the role of the media has been in this fight. Mr. Similo, start off with you. Thank you very much, Nora. Yeah, look, in the case of the NBC, maybe let me just put context to what we do. We've got 11 uh, radio stations that speaks across the spectrum of culture and language. And then linked to that, we have two television uh, uh, channels. And linked to that, we also have quite a strong online presence. So if you quantify that, you would see that our role is intrinsically linked to the lives of everybody that is there. So in terms of this pandemic, we've managed to gravitate towards making sure that the bulk of the programming is geared towards informing, sharing and giving information around what the pandemic is, is actually currently causing within our normal lives. And you will know that uh, I think about two weeks back, I did indicate that we will have a gravitation that will seek to show pro propensity towards uh, programs that are more COVID-19 linked. So on that score, I think we've done our bit in terms of informing, but equally, we have managed to stick to what we believe is credible in terms of information that needs to come. Remember now, when there's vacuum in terms of information sharing, the element of misinformation creeping in easily becomes an element that would seek to destabilize information that is crucially needed by all and sundry. But what we've done is, is really to try and keep to speak to those that believe can bring forward information that would make people understand and appreciate the, uh, the level at which this, 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 this pandemic has come in the case of, of Namibia. Right. Ms. Um, Titus, as an advocacy group, you obviously must have a role to, to, to play in, in, in this difficult time. What exactly would your role uh, be and what has it been so far? Well, uh, thank you. Um, our role largely has been to advocate for access to information and most importantly, the free flow of information. As you've alluded to earlier, um, during a pandemic, the news media becomes a primary source of public communication. Um, and it's at this time that government really um, must acknowledge the central role uh, that the media plays um, in combating uh, this pandemic, in uh, providing access to information um, to the citizens who ultimately need it in order to organize their lives. Um, so that is fundamentally the role that we've played. But allow me just to elaborate um, very slightly on this. Um, in terms of access to information, at this point in time, one of the other issues that we are advocating for is transparency and accountability in the sharing of that information. Um, and presently, I mean, if um, I may uh, present my view on this, I find that the flow of information is rather unidirectional in the sense that information seems to be centralized with policymakers who decide when, how, and by whom that information is shared. This is a very, very powerful position to be in and um, it, uh, it leaves very little room for the role that journalists play in terms of accessing and seeking multiple sources of information, analyzing that information and verifying it and ultimately delivering that to the public. So to answer your question, we promote access to information, the flow of information, which I believe at this present time is highly curtailed and, un and undoubtedly impacts on, on the work of journalists. Um. Ms. Ms. Tartus, if I may just um, take you back. You say that you find the information um, as of now rather unidirectional. Um, what would you like to see? Would you like to see more interaction between the grassroots, the public, and the, the, the leaders, the top? Yes. Um, in terms of the situation that we are currently in, there is a primary source of information. Um, and it has decided how that information is shared. What the media can do uh, to answer your question is not to assume that they know what people want to hear, but to engage with their audiences, to fully understand 
um, and to ask the right questions and to ask those very, very difficult questions um, and unpopular questions because, again, um, let me point to another concern that I have, which is that there is a growing narrative that we are in this together and this is not the time to criticize. What that implies, a censorship, a self-censorship, and that makes the, the role of the media incredibly difficult because the media is supposed to ask these very critical questions as a public interest and a public service for them to do so. Thank you. Mr. Meletsky, your role. Thank you very much. Um, uh, first, I want to mention that um, with COVID-19 came probably one of the greatest or one of the challenges, uh, existential threats to media. But also, it, at the same time, I can safely say that it's one of the, uh, the biggest opportunities to move to the next level of journalism. Um, right now, with what we have seen so far in terms of coverage and so on, we have seen public service journalism, where not just the journalists have decided to serve the nation and the nations at large, even if you see it in the rest of the world, but also you have somehow seen that where there is a bit of openness, transparency from governments and so on, there is more flow of information. And you can even see the success stories there um, in countries where there's been a bit of openness. So in terms of um, us in Namibia, more especially with uh, New Era publication, we wouldn't want to see a news desert. We need to prevent that there is a lack of information out there for people to decide. So therefore, even with the challenges of social distancing, for instance, where you see the disappearance of the street vendors who normally would sell the newspapers, you need to find ways. For example, you see remote newsrooms, uh, distance newsrooms, Therefore, distance journalism. So we have an opportunity to change our thinking. In fact, the business models need not only change within businesses out there, but even within the media houses. Mr. Meleski, you represent one of the biggest um, circulation dailies in the country. What exactly has been the role of your newspaper in the fight against um, COVID? Um, first of all, we have a mandate. Being a, um, an, an organization, company established by an act of parliament, and the mandate is not just to inform, but to educate. Also to uh, be the bridge between government and the people out there. Therefore, Living by our mandate, we should be out there right now and every other moment of COVID. What we are doing is, because of the challenges, as I mentioned, for instance, the social distancing and so on, we had to reduce certain operations. We had to go into a mode of skeleton stuff, we had to go into a mode of re reduced uh, pages and so on. But the message needs to be out there. Uh, we see our role as being an educator in the process, informer. We have seen, for instance, not just the emergence, but fake news being out there. We need to be clear as an authentic source of information. 
that we counter that. But we also need to be careful of infodemic so that we don't come out with so much information that people are left confused. So, overload. yes. So, although journalists and media workers are humans too, they are scared probably about the situations that they are facing, they have a duty. So therefore, from our end, as New Era, for instance, we regard these circumstances that we are in as being part of what government and people out there face. We are in it together. That's what I can say. Now, in a developing country such as ours, with its infrastructural challenges, how do you ensure that information reaches the rural areas, in particular you, Mr. Belitsky? Yes. So we have different platforms. We have a newspaper that is coming out Monday to Friday, and then we have other platforms, multimedia platforms such as social media, which is Facebook, where, for instance, in our, in our case, we can reach 275,000 people. Mainly in the urban areas. I'm talking about the rural areas. Yes. Um, so rural areas, um, we shouldn't underestimate um, people in rural areas. They have access to Facebook. They have access to not everyone, but they have access. Um, there are people who are on Twitter that I know, for instance, are in rural areas. But the biggest, biggest way of, in our case, the biggest way to distribute this is probably to make sure that we share more on the branding side of which there are challenges. For instance, in this case, when you have reduced print run, you don't reach as many people as possible. But also, in that case, you have a situation where, for instance, we share information, co-share, let me put it, co-share with NBC, for instance. So, for a while now, New Era, for instance, had been using NBC and NBC platforms to share some of its information. So NBC has radio stations, for instance. So whatever New Era comes, uh, provides also gets shared on the radio stations through various platforms um, of NBC. So we, we've not just limited ourselves to New Era as such. We have broadened it to share with others whom we think have access to I mean, access to the rural communities. Yes, of course, that will bring me to Mr. Similio, the, 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 the NBC. How does this reach um, the rural areas? Yes, uh, let, let me dissect again. Uh, as I said, uh, you have television, which predominantly is highly urban-based. But we've augmented that with our presence on DSTV as well, to make sure that for those that would ordinarily not be within the space and sphere that we can cover from a television perspective, that through uh, satellites that we can reach them. But we also know that uh, be because of the limitations that, that television in particular uh, presents, not everybody can get to that. Where our biggest reach is, is through radio. And again, I want to just re-emphasize what I said much earlier on in the opening statement, is that through radio we can actually reach part of areas that are extreme remote, even though the picture is not as ideal as it would be. And just maybe to bring it home, when we look at the COVID-19, what we did immediately when information started coming out, we started doing own translations in local languages for our radio stations so that we can actually relay the message in such a way that it should make sense for the ordinary person who is not ordinarily sort of like... Uh, have access to what I would have who stays in an, in, in an urban setting. But we also know that because of the broadband plan in terms of uh, connectivity generally, that does pose as, 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 as a challenge for us. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, the issue of the state of emergency regulations 
linking it with the lockdown of the two regions, that's Erongo and Comas, that in itself presented us also with quite some challenges and also the aspect of working from home. So we had to quickly adapt so that we can still be responsive. So what we're currently having is a situation where we have core journalists that are out in the field, also protected so that they also don't get in touch with the, with the, with the COVID-19 uh, element that is currently within us. And then, as Mr. Maletsky has said, we also have almost like a sharing element where we work together, but that is even further extended. Because when you look at the offices of our, of, of our line ministry, they also have information offices throughout. What we've done over the years, which now comes in quite handy for us, we have been training those communications officials also to file information for us. And all of a sudden now, we have a spread that is bigger than what we as NBC would be able to amass at any given time. So when we look at that, overall, it, it, it does give us a footprint that would seek to say that, yes, we are there, and maybe there are areas that we are not reaching. And, but it also then presents other challenges, because now that people have to work remotely, there's issues of connectivity. You at least need, I think, good 3G to be able to connect everybody that is there. Everybody must have a gadget. So these are all the things that, we've been, that have been in the planning now. So we're trying, I think, the best that we can so that we can still give uh, uh, people access to the information that we are having. However, there is downside to what I'm saying now again. From an advertising perspective, and it's very important that I bring this in, there is this notion that seeks to say that we are funded 100% by government. It is not the case. We contribute at any material time, own revenue between 35 and 45% of operational cost. So that will speak to over 100 million we make on our own, and then it complements what the, the shareholder does. What we have seen now since COVID-19 came on board, comparison that we've just made last week between March and April, we have agencies that are present in Namibia that are selling advertising for us. For those, we have seen a 63% drop in revenue. Now, if you do that and you do an extrapolation and you move forward, it means that this year we stand to lose from revenue anything between 30 to 35, maybe 40 million which then will have an impact in, in, on our ability to be able to bring uh, business to where we would want to, connect us to areas what we believe people should have. Two, three days ago, in the Ironga region, there was a heavy storm, and one of our uh, mountainside transmitters was, was hit by lightning, and we had to send the crew down, but we can't access it on our own where to go and look for a helicopter. And the cost thereof is anything between 25 to 30,000 Namibian dollars. Luckily, we could get one. So yesterday morning, we could connect again the people that were affected. So these are part of the issues that at the best of times will challenge you to the limits of, of what you can do. And that also most probably speaks to the points that were raised by my colleagues. What COVID-19 has done in terms of information flow we have seen now an openness that is coming from public officials in terms of themselves presenting them to the public where they can come and share information that is critical to people. And I firmly of the view that such an approach should not just end post the COVID-19 process in itself. So for, from where we are now, when we look holistically at what we do, we think we're doing the best that we can and our information from a research perspective at any given time through radio, television, and our online platforms, we reach an average 1.6 million people per day. And now, with the in-shelter approach, everybody is home now. So there is even a, a, even a more vested interest that entities like the NBC that are forming part of entertainment should bring out programs that will allow people to get the information for one, get people to be entertained, and all of that. That is why we, we have structured now our programming in such a way that it appeals to those. Yesterday, someone was complaining, uh, complaining to me, saying that I only want to see COVID-19 on NBC or on radio. And then I was saying, yes, I hear you, but remember, you are a segment. They are kids. 
there are the millennials, there's Generation Z, there's Generation X, there's the, the boomers. So for us, we need to put this all in one basket, but at the same time make sure that we cater for everybody. So that is fundamentally part of the challenges from a logistical uh, position that we have to deal with as we are moving forward. But one thing that I can say for sure is that the look and feel of the NBC can never be the same. We can, for instance, not now revert to what we was, what we were before COVID-19. We will have to adjust so that we maintain the momentum as we are moving forward. We'll come to that issue on, on how it has changed the way the media um, works. But for now, with, with this global pandemic, we have seen that information changes almost daily. How do you ensure that this information gets out there quickly well, and timelessly? You, you need to read. And as, as Zoe and Mr. Maleski were saying, you need to have access. Those that sit with the information must bring it to you. Otherwise, others will play in that space. And this is what will confuse, will confuse people. If there is a way through which the current system can be further improved, naturally it will be to the benefit of, of everybody. But we don't sit at that level where we can actually determine that. And the fact that there is a lockdown, it also in some areas and the rules regulating the state of emergency, it also means that for journalists, there is also a challenge of getting to those that ordinarily can bring information, information which is then critical to those that need it. But what we do from the NBC, we follow what is happening on the websites of the WHO. We follow what is happening in the countries where COVID-19 is, is key, like this morning. When I woke up, I saw that the, US, the USI is now leading. They have surpassed Italy. So it also shows you how the gravitation of this is happening. But on the other hand, when you look at the Chinese uh, element of what is happening, you have seen that there is a decrease. The states that was at the time locked down, they are busy opening up, op opening up again. But if we bring it home to Namibia, we see at this stage, based on what we have, there is a stable, a, a stable sort of movement as to whether that is what it is and it will remain is something else, but it is commendable because I think we're still sitting at 16 yeah. of those that have tested and three, uh, and three that, have, that, have been, that have recovered. So for, from a Namibian perspective, it does indicate that there's most probably an element of good work that is done. But for me, I cannot talk into that space because that's quite a highly specialized area. Well, so I can only speak around yes. what we need to report on. Obviously, it's, it's, it's relatively easy um, for the NBC to disseminate uh, information quickly because of all your, your, your platforms. I imagine it must be a bit more difficult for you, Mr. Maletsky. Yes, it's definitely difficult, as I said, because we had to re reduce the brand runs. You don't get the footprint that, uh, that you were getting. You don't get access to shops that you used to sell in. Um, you, the vendors, as I mentioned earlier, um, because of social distancing and so on, have uh, reduced in terms of numbers from the streets. So it's quite a challenge, but it's also an opportunity for media houses to really up their game with digital platforms. Um, an e-paper will have give access to someone in his bed, in his lounge, or somewhere out there at the cradle post, if he has access to it. Um, and, and it's an opportunity for some of us to really move into that direction. Um, and if we had already been moving to up our game so that we, we, we make sure that people have access to information, um, uh, right now, it can't be business as usual, as they say, um, thinking that after COVID, you have to go back to the same uh, model of operation, as in relying too much or too heavily on the print, um, relying too heavily on your distributional channels that you've been using. You need to change. 
So, and it's the same even with the newsrooms that we operate in. Um, distance newsrooms, distance journalism needs to kick in big time, which basically means that your, 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 your workstations need to move to out there, being out there. Workstations can no longer be in the newsrooms. People can no longer be confined to newsrooms. And, and even um, things like conferences, newsroom conferences that you are having in the mornings need to change. So it's a whole change of mindset that we have to see going forward from COVID. So nothing should be the same again as it had been the past month or so. Zoe, would you like to say something on, on that issue? Um, just to um, add some additional information, it is um, the COVID-19 pandemic has brought to the fore a very dramatic um, challenge to, to, the, uh, to the media, but that challenge has been there for some time. Um, in terms of the digitalization challenge to the media and how that has affected business models, how that um, has impacted ad revenue, etc. But um, what has happened um, very recently is that it's been, it must have been a dramatic learning curve because journalists now, print journalists now, had to become multimedia um, journalists uh, providing content for online and offline uh, platforms. But I think it's important to raise this issue. Um, while a lot of this information has, is now available online, I don't think we've had the discussion about the cost of data um, and how that impacts on the receipt and, and, and access to information. It is a fundamental access to information issue. Um, and um, I think that more needs to be done to discuss, comparatively speaking, Namibia ranks well uh, with respect to affordability of data, but um, the issue of access to information, this information that is now available digitally, um, how consumers uh, receive that, and in addition to that, um, I mean, it, it, it calls for a broader discussion, especially since education is now being pushed online. So, um, yes, this is a fundamental issue that is impacting on the media in its operations, but also on citizens in terms of how they access information. So we have just mentioned quite a critical point around access. If we look at internet penetration, I think in our country, and I stand to be corrected, most probably stands at about 35%, meaning that those that have access to using internet almost on a daily basis that amounts to about 36% of the population. Now, with the new way in which we are looking at doing things, that poses a challenge for the ordinary Namibian. Don't talk about me who might have access to that because of virtue of either a position that I may have or the work where I am. It would mean that those that may not have that type of leverage in terms of being able to access might, might be cut off. Hence, there is now a clarion call out to, the, to, the, to the, 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 the mobile operators, those that are controlling connectivity, to look into how best can they deal with this matter so that they can still make sure that people have access to this. NBC is also not immune to that. Our whole transmission network currently is running on a platform where we have an understanding through Telecom Namibia and Intelsat. Mm -hmm. And we are struggling now to take care of payments in, in that regard. But because of relationships that we are having, sometimes we can defer payments. Should the day come where they call up whatever we owe, it would mean then there's a blackout in terms of what is happening uh, on, on NBC platforms across. And I can imagine the smaller the entity becomes, especially from having either the ability to do this, that then puts further pressure on, on what is happening there. And, and part of what we will be seeing happening is that if these things are not attended to, we will start seeing people being laid off, especially in areas where the models that are based on revenue incoming, we will see a degeneration 
of entities being able, being, not being able to actually maintain and keep, and keep people on board. And our entities as well are not immune to that. That is why you will see that our reporting now mm. is no longer just about health around COVID-19. We are forced now, we need to look at what does it do to the economy? What does it do to the sports life? I mean, all sports activities have stopped. And from an entertainment perspective, people on Saturdays would normally be sitting watching these big games. So it means then that there is something that needs to come into that place so that it can augment to and take care. Yes, and it's even worse now that you must stay in your house. What do you do? That is why from our end, we realize that we need to speak to everybody and not just mm. the, the decision maker. That is why at our programming outside this platform, we've been engaging uh, psychologists, we've been engaging people that understands the economy, we've been engaging ordinary people. I mean, we carried a story two, three days back of a lady who was working at an establishment where one of the people that tested positive was there. And where she, in a very painful manner, was sharing how the public around her were looking at her, understanding that she's one of those that were working there. So these are the stories away from decision makers that we also bring to the fore. And equally, I think we've had chances to speak to people that were selling along the roadside. Because point now is they don't even have any other means apart from the, the stimulus package that was, uh, was announced by, the, by our Minister of Finance. I think both Zoe and Mr. Maletsky also just said a short while back that for the print media, you normally have the guys that are selling. It means now, as we speak, they're out of business. And I can imagine what it does to the print media because people that are at home, will they want to go out, go and buy a paper? The longer this thing goes, and the more there's other platforms that augment the practical side of getting a paper, that will put them also in trouble. So the, the, the challenges are really, they are real, they are there. And our role is that we must try and do this, create hope, speak about these things, and at the same time be real. Thank you. Um, we are going to cross over now to the floor to take questions from uh, the media. But before we do that, we are going to get a health update from Dr. Theo Ben Kandetu, who is the head of the COVID-19 task force. Dr. Theo Ben, please. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Madam Chair, but I would just like to make um, a little bit of a, of a correction. I am not the head of the task force, I'm just the head of case management, which is an arm of the task force. Um, so I have a very, very brief um, update to give. Um, I'm glad to report that um, from yesterday, nothing has changed. We still have 16 confirmed cases. Um, we have th 13 active cases. Um, so what that means is there are th th three of the cases that have recovered um, that initially tested positive and after um, their isolation period and their treatment um, have now tested negative and who have since been discharged. Um, and then additionally, just from the laboratory side, um, both NIP as well as PathCare to date have tested a combined 430 samples nationwide, and they continue to increase that number in terms of, 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 of testing. There are also about 110 people who are in mandatory quarantine facilities nationwide. Um, that number will continue to drop in the coming days as people um, come to the completion of the quarantine period. So that is it for um, the health update. Um, I just would like to ask the um, 
chairperson to allow me just to go off script <laughs> um, and say a few words. Um, as this is Easter Sunday, um, a time for many Namibians um, to be at home with their families and loved ones, um, I humbly plea um, to the nation to join me in, in, in thanking as well as praying for the frontliners who may not be at home with their loved ones and, and their families because of their commitment to the fight against COVID-19. We thank you, every single one of you, for your selflessness, heroism, hard work and dedication to ensuring that we as a nation are prepared to respond to the COVID-19 outbreak. We continue to pray for your mental and physical well-being and we as a ministry, as well as our key stakeholders nationwide, as well as internationally, will continue to make sure that we equip you um, with uh, the necessary equipment, materials, PPE, knowledge, um, to make sure that you go out to your respective duty stations and do what you do best. To the public, as always, we remind you to please adhere to the social distancing guidelines and to please make use of our Emergency Operations Center hotline 0800 100 100 for any COVID-related information and advice. So with those few words, um, we w wish to... Um, we, we wish you a blessed and safe Sunday. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Kandetu. Okay, um, I'm now going to throw open um, the floor to the media houses um, that are here. I'm going to start with a young lady here. Please give your name. And please keep it to two questions per journalist, please. Can you take that mic over there? The next one, get ready. Um, good morning. My name is Shamin Gashihewe. I'm a journalist with the Namibian newspaper. I wanted to find out from the panelists, um, what is the future of the media after this pandemic? I mean, what are we looking at? Because people might be laid off after this, uh, like we spoke about sales, advertising going down. And then I wanted to find out from uh, Mr. Maletsky, um, can you perhaps elaborate on the opportunities that the media can embrace during this time, seeing that there are so many challenges and then perhaps um, how can these challenges be mitigated? Thank you. Mr. Maletsky. Go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so I mentioned that um, COVID brought with it challenges but also opportunities. There are, um, there are opportunities as in going online. If you go online um, or your, your audience part grows online, you unlock that growth part, um, you are reducing your cost, for instance, on print runs. Um, so if you've been spending, say, a million on a monthly print run, and you reduce your brand run by half, of course, you are saving the 500,000. So there is a saving there that you can use to, uh, to, to, to stimulate growth within the organization by sort of probably going for digital platforms. Um, um, there are so many platforms currently, as in uh, um, uh, where, where you can really send forth or brought forth your information where you can share your information. So there, there, there are those type of opportunities. There, um, w w what we see at the moment, and, and it's because we've been, it's over 100 years and so on, 
for instance, in Namibia, 120 probably, that we have, we have seen print, and some of us even say that we like feeling that print in our hands. You know, they, there are people who would even buy a newspaper despite having, um, having um, subscribed to e-paper and other platforms. So, but we need to change. We need to change because, uh, the, because of the speed at which news is moving at the moment. Um, you don't have to wait for the next morning, for instance, for a newspaper to, uh, um, to come out. We have seen big papers, Times, uh, Guardian, um, in, other, in, in other parts of the world, where they have removed or partly removed the paywalls, for instance. Um, in the process, you might think that they are losing a bit of income, but they are gaining more readership. So there are the, those type of opportunities. So we, we, we need to just sit down and relook at our business models. Uh, there are so many opportunities out there. Um, even within advertising, um, you can still have the same advertising uh, in uh, an e-paper, for instance, and other papers, yes. Absolutely. Mr. Stimilo, uh, I'll come back to you, Jake. Yeah, yes, no, uh, look, the, the second part of the question. Yes, uh, yeah, future, media, stuff, and all of that. Look, our reality now, it's not just because of COVID-19. The advent and the evolution of technology has moved things in a way where we must do everything differently from an NBC perspective. Previously, you would have someone goes to school up to grade 12, and then they finish, they go to university, do either a national diploma or a degree, and go to honors, masters, maybe PhD level in media studies. And then they come back, they're an expert, and then they start doing work. However, what this thing has done, which is called a smartphone, it has brought in a revolution in terms of how things are done. Part of what we've seen is that now, someone who's creatively great in what they do, if they get a smartphone and they get some software, they can go and create 5, 10, 15, 20 minutes long piece as content that works, that has a pull. Now, if you look at this now, now you will say, but I've spent thousands here in training this person, and here comes the other person, Within three months, they get content that is compelling. What it says for entities like NBC and also the print media that has evolved now into producing content as well, we need to start knowing what type of content your audience wants. Because if you can't talk to that, it will then mean that you will become redundant, you will become a cake, and you will have no relevance. And this is why I said earlier on, part of what will have to, be, to change if we are to preserve and keep what we have, it's an immediate change in terms of how we're going to be looking at creating content that will still speak to the little bit of resources that we may have. Anything outside that will create a situation where the sustainability of any such business will not be guaranteed, and that includes the NBC as well. Ms. Titus, um, the thing is, not everybody in the country has access to smartphones or have access to, to, to Wi-Fi. Would this not be an elitist um, approach? Um, I think I alluded to it earlier when I spoke to the issue of the cost of data to some extent. Yes. Um, to answer your question, but also just to go back very, very slightly, I believe that this is a watershed moment for the media. Um, journalism will never be the same again, um, and the way journalism is done. But it has been evolving for some time now. But this has brought it into a stark reality that um, things must change. So my appeal in terms of looking to the future would be, okay, firstly, um, journalists need to organize themselves. They need to consider how they will be doing journalism in future. They need to consider job security. They need to consider whether they have the skills for what media is going to be like in the future. Um, that's just one aspect. Then in terms of, um, and, and responding to you uh, more directly, as you know, they, I, I wouldn't, 
I, I wouldn't say that going digital is the solution because um, print plays a very specific role in terms of literacy and that's important and has, must be retained. Also, um, in terms of digital, the advertising revenue um, is failing. Media houses have not been able to monetize digital content and it must be monetized and it must be profitable because those media houses need to employ journalists and that comes at a cost. So the business model and a hybrid model of sorts will need to be considered. Thank you. Can we, um, yeah, um, cross over to you. Thank you. Uh, this question can be, or these questions can be answered by all the panelists. Um, I wanted to find out in terms of information, information dissemination. Um, me personally, uh, from the content development perspective, um, I produce contents for radio stations, especially the community radio stations. And um, what I see here, especially for what is happening at the communication center, the information that comes out here is time bound, meaning that it's live. And for those that have missed it, especially in the rural areas and also even here in the urban areas, this information most of the time is actually found online. And then after the broadcast, it means that one is actually forced to go back and actually seek for it online. What I do myself, I buy newspapers. I buy newspapers every day, Monday to, Saturday, to, to Friday. And then what I do, I send these papers on Sunday to the village. And um, that means at my village, they get to get this paper. So my question is, um, NBC now has been off since December last year or even before that between 9 and 7, 9 p.m. and 7 a.m. in the morning. So between that whole time, is there no materials that can be broadcasted to reach out to the rural areas and then also uh, for radio to keep repeating some of the contents that might be time bound in order for the people that are out there to get this information and to be updated on time as well. Thank you. To Mr. Similo, yes. yes um, short let, hours. Uh, yeah, let How me start impact? with the last one. Uh, NBC television is not NBC. I, I, I think I need to clear that. Yes, NBC television is not NBC. NBC is defined by the collection of what we have, where in our case, radio is the flagship of what we do. So from a radio perspective, we are there 24, 24 hours around the clock. I'll speak shortly to the austerity measures. But in terms of television, just looking now, if I come back to the question as it is, when we look at COVID-19, what we've done is that, again, if you don't watch NBC, you won't know that information linked to COVID is almost taking out a bigger share of what we do even just on the television space. There's repeats and repeats and repeats of all the programs that we are doing. But I need to stress, NBC television and news for that matter does not define the NBC. The news element of what we do compounded makes out about 30 to 35 percent of overall broadcasts that we do. There is a bigger share of broadcasting that happens throughout the day. So for the radio element, it's 100 percent there. It works and it has been working. Coming back to what we are doing here with the COVID uh, platforms that are here and our own, this is mirrored on radio as well. And what we've done is that for the, uh, the, the, the services at radio level that are not necessarily in English, the producers and presenters that are there post the process. They must unpack and bring it back and use local language to explain exactly, to, to explain exactly where we are. So with the reach that we have from a radio perspective, we believe that the majority of people are not really sort of like marginalized. Where the challenge is, is more access in terms of reach from an infrastructure perspective, which then curtails both radio and TV as a whole. And of course, we know that radio has the, the largest reach um, in this country. Um, I'm going to take a, a question now from Pancho Mbilongeni. Thank you so much, uh, Nora. Uh, my first question comes directly from uh, my first question comes directly from a taxi driver, and his question is: 
I want to bring to you information that in the Kavango East, we have people that don't even have access to radio. They are very far away, and some of them don't even have cell phones. How will they get this information, especially as it pertains to the stimulus package? Then my next question is, uh, looking at our world today, we have very different approaches to tackling the pandemic from compulsory face masks in many Asian countries to Western countries only moving there slowly. Uh, and we also have, for example, China not really allowing the free flow of information in their country. And I just wanted to know, what do, do media practitioners here in Namibia think our approach should be when we're trying to source information internationally, given that if you look at the new stories, there is a lot of smearing of other countries with the U.S. trying to discredit China, China trying to undermine the U.S.'s efforts. How do we discern the valid stories? Thank you. Thank you. Um, yes, we only have four minutes, so please give us very brief um, answers. Mr. Smilo, begin with you, uh, very it, briefly. Yes, in terms of access, both radio and TV speaks to the national broadband plan which is unfortunately outside our ambit. I think in terms of that connectivity, and a very valid point, we depend heavily on what the infrastructure is, because at this stage, even with the rollout of DDT, television captures about, I think, 74.5% where people live. We must not now talk country. Remember, our country is very big, sparsely populated, whereas radio has about close to 80% thereof. What I know is that more than, I think, two, three months back, the National Broadband Plan was approved by the Ministry of Information and Communication. Now, that seeks to speak to the points that, that Zoe was also raising. Until that is put into action where connectivity can happen at all levels within the country, we will all remain having spaces that are dark, speaking to both uh, uh, cell phone connectivity, radio connectivity, and, and all of that, meaning that there has to be elements through which we must augment how this information is going through. Very importantly, I know, Nola, you are under pressure. Last week, Thursday, I had a meeting with the representative of WHO here, and part of our discussion, which I'm busy putting a, a paper together that should go to the ministry, uh, our line ministry, is to say that part of what we must do, linking to the question of access, we need to start engaging local councils so that they can also become a voice of speaking to the people that they're representing. Because where they are, they can speak in the language that people understand. They know exactly where they are. So we're hoping that through that, maybe we can bridge some of the elements that we cannot reach from a, technology, a technological perspective. Would you like to say something, uh, Mr. Hodges? Yes. Um, just... In terms of accessing international sources and verifying information, um, we have reached out to some journalists to ask what kind of uh, support that they uh, support they need at this time, and that has come up. So we are in a position to facilitate webinars or access to al alternative sources. In terms of the stimulus package. Um, I mean that is 8.1 billion that needs to to cater for the entire country. Um, I've been thinking about this, and I think that there should be, in the short term, a very special fund for the media set aside um, because of this very, very important role of information dissemination that it plays. Um, but also longer term, there should be, gov and government in a democratic society has the responsibility to ensure that media is viable is sustainable and accessible to all citizens. So a discussion must be had about the long-term impact um, of an, a range of things on the media and its sustainability. And that, ideally, I would like to see the Editors' Forum engaging um, uh, with, with government. So um, the other thing, um, okay, finally, Nora, as a final statement, um, there's so much to say, but as a final statement, um, I'd like to say that journalism is often a thankless job, and I think um, there is need for a sincere thank you to journalists for their service. Right, thank you. Um, we have no more questions from, from the floor, um, but we will be coming to you. So I would like 
the concluding remarks from our panelists. Can we start with Mr. Meletsky, please? Um, so I, I just wanted to say something. Um, I hope the finance minister is listening. We, we now know that media is essential, which basically means um, uh, Charmaine was asking, going forward, how do we help prevent layoffs and so on from media houses? I hope Mr. Shimi and his team will be looking at some sort of, in this stimulus package, some sort of um, a tax holiday for media houses. This could be directly to them or even indirectly. Uh, uh, looking at a tax break for an advertiser could work. Uh, a tax break for a subscriber could work. Um, short term, some sort of loans uh, towards the media to help them through the process of, of even if it's a, a three months or six months, uh, it could help um, because we, we are really in a, a uncharted waters, um, uh, not just Namibia, but the rest of the world. So, uh, in, in short, tax breaks or some sort of um, uh, tax facility will work. Um, and as Zoe was saying to wrap up, um, also journalists and media houses being essential workers, um, we have again seen that um, without them, we can't. Without them, we can't. Um, so therefore, we can only salute them and re respect what they do. Uh, in a lot of instances, people would be pointing out only the negatives, but here has been a case where um, on a daily basis they have been throwing their lives on the front line uh, to deliver up-to-date news to Namibia and the rest of the world. Thank you. Mr. Stimila? Yes, uh, on, on, on the briefly, yeah, last words is the issue around the, minister, the new Minister of Finance. Look, I'm in a privileged position, even my line minister is also new. So they know what they must do. That's the one. However, there's another element that is not being addressed. There's the corporate world out there, corporate business in this country. It's high time that they start appreciating what is Namibia and start supporting us so that we can meaningfully support the arts from a content production perspective. They've been very silent in this journey. And now that even government is stressed, we would want to see them also setting up some form of fund that will come to the media so that from a content perspective that we all be assisted so that we can move forward. Otherwise, if we can't do that, platforms of this nature might also have a natural death or they may not have the impact that would ordinarily improve the lives of ordinary Namibians. Thank you. Ms. Titus? Um, emphasizing again my uh, recommendation for a special fund or stimulus package for the media, but also considering the very important role that the media plays in the democracy and the fact that such stimulus packages are active in other countries, but they have come with challenges and it's necessary for us to understand that. Challenges of receiving uh, government support, which comes with potential um, issues around quality and independence. At this point in time, a free and independent media that is professional and delivering information is what Namibia needs first and foremost. Thank you. Thank you very much. And um, there you have it. You have seen the critical, the critically important role that um, the media plays in the fight against the COVID-19 um, pandemic. These are our unsung heroes who need our full support, both material, financial, and um, um, uh, emotional um, support. Because in these days, in these times of lockdown, the challenges that we face, the media is always there, risking their lives to bring you the information. So thank you, all of you. Thank you to, to the media. 
and from all of us here and from me, Nora Apollos, it's goodbye.